This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet and Nick Martin. I thank you both so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And uh, this is going to be a listener story show. And I have with me Mr. Adam Sane of Conspiranormal. How's it going, everybody? And uh, Ren Collier. Howdy, everyone. It's been a while since you've been on, Ren. It has been. Um, been traveling. Um, got to meet Adam. Went to Paramania uh, 2019, which is a fun time. That's right. That's right. Nice. We had a. We had a blast hanging out at the Bigfoot Museum. Yeah. Get to meet uh, Josh Cutchin and Greg Bishop and a bunch of really cool people and had great conversations. Um, summon an angel. It's pretty cool. Right. Summon yeah. an angel. That, mm-hmm. was a, that was a very cool experience, Ren. I had a Thank lot you. to say about it. You, you, uh, you want to you elaborate? <laughs> well, everyone kind of like wanted to have a demonstration of like, an, you know, an actual like ritual. So, yeah. um, Originally, I was going to do one of uh, our Via Solis elixir rites, but I couldn't get the hotel printer to like print out the the missives for it. So I was like, you know, I need people to be able to read a script, and if they can't, you know, because they don't know the ritual. Um, so without being able to do that, I decided, well, I'll just do a like a drawing spirits in a crystal style um, uh, kind of conjuration of an angel um, using like a table of practice that I drew out. And um, it was kind of funny. We like all went up to my hotel room to do the conjuration. Um, and we didn't really know. I didn't really know who to talk to for the conjuration um, because we weren't quite sure what we wanted, you know, to, to do to change for the ritual. We ended up deciding to uh, do something for Greg. Like he was going to be having a, uh, a talk coming up soon, um, a presentation so we wanted to you know make sure that the presentation went smoothly and that he was eloquent and able to uh to present his ideas to people and um i was like trying to figure out well who would the angel of like public speaking be and um then it started raining outside not and, just raining thundering and lightning at the yeah same thundering time. and lightning yeah. yeah just like downpour all of a sudden and i was like oh yeah gabriel Gabriel is yeah. the archangel of water, and he is the, you know, the sort of angel of knowledge, of like learning and teaching, especially. So I was like, oh, that's perfect. So we, um, we all kind of like moved a table over to the center of the, the room, and um, uh, we all got around it. And I did like the full sort of operant field uh, setup that my, my mentor, Scott Stenwick, taught me, where you sort of tune a space to a specific element, in this case, water, and... Uh, and then do like sort of a basic like conjuration. Uh, and I think I, I offered some, some whiskey that I had as, as payment or, you know, so to, for him to carry out the thing for Greg. And um, it was cool. I, everyone seemed like there was a real sense of like, like pressure and like what uh, Stephen Skinner talks about, like kind of like a cult pressure, like a sense of heaviness in the room while it was going on. Um, mm-hmm. And during it, we had one of the members, uh, Carlos, he was wearing a uh, set of headphones and using my uh, spirit box. So he was actually writing down all the words he was hearing. And there was some really interesting stuff that he heard, um, like sort of things saying like, uh, like, I'm here, um, I agree. And um, at the very end, he said, uh, like, pilot you are you pilot or something like that which is interesting because greg is a, a licensed pilot hmm. so yeah he, yeah so he heard cool stuff on the spirit box and you know we did the ritual and everything you know we we didn't you know an angel didn't descend to the ceiling or anything <laughs> but uh it was it was fun it was it was fun to be able to like show everyone like kind of like what you know th- that type of ritual would look like and um it was really funny afterwards like uh, i was sitting outside um the hotel and, and David Metcalf walked out and he was like, Rin, 
you're really you're really a wizard <laughs> it was like he was like I don't, <laughs> I don't mean that in like a sarcastic way like you really seem to know what you're doing and everything that was amazing i was like thank you thank you it, it was like very much like a, it was one of the nicest compliments anyone's ever told me so i was glad that um people didn't think it was like super goofy or weird no it, i i didn't think that at all it, my impression of it was well there were two things that i felt and one was the way that you were doing it like the I guess the intonation is the chanting. Mm-hmm. It reminded me very much of like kind of similar to like a Greek Orthodox church service in a way. Yeah. And it was I, Greek I words. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it really, yeah. So I was curious about what the language was that you were using. I didn't know there it was like a, an Enochian language or something like that, but yeah, uh, it wasn't Enochian. There was a uh, Hebrew and uh, some Latin and then some Greek uh, at okay. the end was like mostly Greek. Yeah, so it, it, it felt just like that. And so it had that same kind of ritual significance to it. And then the second part was I could definitely feel like this power in the room, mm-hmm. but I I can't really say that it was something that was outside of us, but I could say that maybe it was like all of us that were around that table generating that kind of electricity, that energy. That's how it yeah. felt to me. Yeah, definitely. And you could feel like that that sort of magical tension in the room. Yeah. So even if we didn't conjure an actual angel, I think you were right there that there was there was definitely a lot of energy generated from just having all those people focusing and, and moving along with me and and like doing the ritual with me and taking it seriously. Nice. Yeah, it was um it was really interesting experience. And I have to really wonder what the person in the next room thought at two thirty in the morning <laughs> <laughs> at the La Quinta Inn in Alpharetta, Georgia. They're probably yeah. like, just like, what is going on on in there? Yeah, they hear me in the other room, all being like, Romo Yunges, Subichimo Teletarkai, Abedexia Shinoche, Suparistera Demonos. Yeah, They're probably like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never, oh. I, I. It was cool. It was cool to experience that, Ren. I th- I really thank you for doing it. I mean, I'm always kind of skeptical about that stuff and just a little kind of trepidatious about it. But I guess that you know, once we were doing it, it really was like, oh, this is this is kind of this is kind of neat, you know? Yeah. It's just a just a different like kind of religious experience, really, is how it felt. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm I'm glad that you got yeah. a lot out of it. You know, that's that's I kind of wanted everyone to kind of see like this is. This is what it's like to really do this stuff, and that's that's the kind of stuff I do sort of weekly at the at the OTO lodge. Right. Well, I mean, would you consider Thelema kind of like a religion in a I mean, way? Could you can kind of consider it in that probably fashion? Probably considered now? it that. Yeah, right. I mean, Thelema is definitely a religion. Um, yeah. I'm I'm not necessarily super religious when it comes to Thelema. I I, I like. I call myself a Thelemite because I do like agree with the basic tenets of like Thelema. But I don't like, you know, treat Crowley like a prophet or like okay. do any kind of like devotional or worship of it. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just more of like a it, to me, I treat it more like a philosophy than I do a, a sort of religion. But it is technically a religion. Yeah. Like they yeah. have um, they have their own church, like the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica. Do they have a 501c3? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's now cool. that they, they can only get the government to let them do peyote, then <laughs> yeah, be in, yeah. Be in business, right? <laughs> All right, let's get into a few stories here. So this one's interesting. Uh, it's short. This is from Lily, and she says, "When my son was about ten or eleven months old, he and I went to an estate sale one Saturday morning. The sale did not open till nine a.m., so we waited outside with several others. There was a woman and her baby girl standing nearby us." My son was looking around and noticed the baby girl. When she looked at him, he screamed and grabbed at me. He looked back at the other baby and again screamed and became very very agitated. The mother became aware of what was happening and laughed a little and said all the kids that have that reaction to her. My son (laughs) and I didn't stay long at the sale. Looking at the baby didn't have any effect on me and I didn't get a bad vibe at all. She didn't look unusual in any way. Her eyes were a green, gray, little hair, uh, normal looking baby girl. Her mother had dark hair in the style of the day and looked normal and average in every way. It was such an odd encounter. I haven't forgotten about it even after 30 years. 
I sometimes wonder why that mother thought it was funny that other ch- children reacted, reacted to her baby like that and where that creepy baby is now. And she says, I'd like to know if you or any of your listeners have ever heard of anything like this happening. Wow. Um, I can't say I've ever heard of anything like that, but it instantly reminded me of like Rosemary's baby. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, what's wrong with his eyes? <coughs> It's almost well, like a black eyed kids story, sort of, but without the, you know, without the black eyed kids, but it's like sort of like a sinister child for some reason. Like, I wonder what that kid saw, like if they were able ever able to describe like what about the baby, like freaked them out so bad. Yeah, but at 11, 10 months old, probably not. Yeah. I wonder if they even remember it happening when they probably were Probably not. Yeah. The, uh, the only thing I could say is that I've had, I often have kids, just little kids like that, just stare at me. <laughs> and I don't know if it's just that I'm a big guy with long hair or if it's the energy. I suspect it's the energy uh, mm-hmm. because kids can see that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or, kids... or they could, or they can feel it. Yeah. yeah. Or they can feel it. Yeah. And, and I... animals will do the same damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think kids are kind of like weird like that in, in the sense that they do like just stare at people because they don't, they lack like any sort of like social programming. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I, I also like, it sort of makes me wonder like what the kids saw because sometimes mm-hmm. I think kids see, and oh, maybe I'm we sure saw them, we saw them too when we were kids. We just don't really remember it because it seemed yeah, completely we, normal at the time. We learned to filter it out. Yeah. Um, I remember being at a friend of mine's house and, uh, first time I had met his cats and all three of his cats kind of surrounded me and just stared at me. And after a while, he's like, what did you do to my cat? <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes too, now that I'm thinking about it, it's, it's not like the same thing, but you know, sometimes kids are like really scared of like bizarre things. True. true. Like just the way, like a, a stick is like laying on the ground or like, Something that, you know, like, as an adult, like, you, you can't tell why it's upsetting them so bad. But it makes me wonder yeah. if there's just, like, something there that we can't see. Or, or they're not processing that reality quite right yet. Yeah. I mean, it, you see some the same behavior, like, you're talking about the animals, too. Like, if you ever notice how animals will look all over the room sometimes, like, they can see something there that, that you Oh, yeah. yeah. Or play with something that's not there. Yeah, exactly. Of course, that could also be too that with an animal, the dogs, cats, whatever, that they could, I mean, their senses of hearing and smell are so much better than ours that they might be just picking up on that. That is yeah. true. Like hearing something in the walls that, that you can't right. hear. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because we, we think of things as like perceiving with our eyes. Well, these animals mm-hmm. can perceive with their ears or their nose much yeah. better than we can. Hmm. Yeah, they can. They can, especially dogs, can tell so much from a scent. Yeah, and vibration, and vibrations, and those yeah. types of things. When you're a little lower to the ground, you might be able to feel that. So yeah, I mean, I've never heard of that before, where where someone freaked out about a baby, um, when, especially when it was another baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> it makes it makes me think the Simpsons with the the Maggie and the baby with the one eyebrow. <laughs> it could just it could have just been an ugly baby man i mean that's, that's entirely <laughs> it's entirely possible somebody had an ugly baby uh, or it was really a demon or it was a demon it was definitely yeah. demon baby uh, <laughs> demon baby all right so i have a three here from johnny killer uh and uh he actually sent these back in 2017 so i wanted to catch up on these because these are interesting and he said, uh, I, I want to add, uh, yeah, I've listened to many shows and finally decided it's time to share some of my stories of strangeness. And I wanted to add that a huge reason for this is I've experienced far too many aha moments while listening to simply sit back and not contribute to the pool of data. What I mean by aha moments might better be described as an I thought I was the only one moment. And so he said, uh, just a few quick quick pieces of info i have had at least 10 sleep paralysis paralysis experiences i can remember the first one i was about 15 and i was not in my own house it was pretty run-of-the-mill and this is a later one 
He says, uh, this occurred while I was in my early 20s. I think it's important to note that I drank heavily and was in an unstable state of mind, an unstable state at this time in my life. My girlfriend at the time lived in a small one-room apartment. This meant her futon mattress was directly in front of her closet. The closet is why I'm including this story. Well, you know how it goes, can't move, totally paralyzed, and yet completely awake. I remember inwardly screaming at the top of my lungs and hearing a small whimper escaping my lips in reality. This part is difficult to explain, though. There was a definite rise in intensity. Anyone who has ever experimented with mind-altering chemicals will know what I'm what I mean. Just an overall feeling that everything was getting more insane, for lack of a better term. Here's the kicker: almost in tandem with this feeling of rising craziness, dread, fear, etc., children's laughter started coming from the closet. The door was closed. (laughs) The door was closed. If I remember correctly, I was either already looking in that direction when the paralysis kicked in or managed to force my eyeballs to look there. I fully remember looking at the closet door as I heard the laughter. Then he says, isn't it strange how it's difficult to recall exactly when the paralysis wears off and what you were thinking or doing when it wore off? I think this is the case for most people anyway. So, yeah, that's creepy. That's like mm-hmm. more than creepy. That's absolutely frightening. <laughs> yeah, the, you the imagine aud- that. Come on. <laughs> yeah, the auditory uh, hallucinations during uh, sleep paralysis episodes can be really weird. Um, like yeah. I've heard uh, when, like when I was when when I was a kid, I remember hearing a, it sounded like there was like a party or a dinner party or something going on in my parents' house. Like there were lots of voices, like people talking. Um, like glasses clinking plates you know sounds of like forks on plates and that sort of stuff that's mm-hmm. a common occurrence in a lot of paranormal phenomenon really that's a real co- oh yeah people hear mm-hmm. people here in like haunted houses or supposed haunted houses they'll they'll hear that kind of like you know conversations upstairs maybe like the sound of a party going on just like you described mm-hmm. that's a common mm-hmm. Thing that people will hear will actually hear that kind of thing interesting like yeah there's that, a that, whole other reality going on on top of your of our own reality yeah i mean after that episode of Riker and stark it makes me think even more about that like was it just a parallel <laughs> universe that i was right, listening right, to right right yeah uh, that's interesting though that you that you put it in as a um sleep paralysis experience because you know no one in those those type of uh that has those type of experiences usually like elaborates any further. Mm-hmm. So it's possible that uh, maybe they're having a sleep paralysis experience when that's going on or something. And they, and uh, they don't similar. know it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like maybe it's a similar state of mind or being that you, you, you're in like an altered state. Like when mm-hmm. the, the listener was talking about that, that feeling like when you're coming up on, you know, LSD or whatever, like that is definitely how it feels like before you start to have like an out of body experience. Like a lot of people refer to it like, you know, this feeling of like humming that just takes place in the body, like vibrations and stuff. But in a in a sense, it is too like also like an increasing amount of like tension that you feel. Um, and he, And he's right, too, about how when people are in that state, like their thoughts don't necessarily make sense. So sometimes your memories get really weird and jumbled up after you've had an experience like that hmm. it's yeah. almost like a like like dream like you still like you're like dreaming but you're awake so yeah. like your your thoughts don't make any sense hmm. uh so he he has three experiences he shared that was the first one and he says this one has a little bit of everything and i'm gonna get right into it i was in my early 20s drinking alcohol to excess every other night and generally depressed dark and weak if not totally hammered I won't interject that my own personal opinion is that our physical and mental state definitely plays a part in strange experiences. Simply put, if these entities or whatever feed on fear and general darkness, then anyone who is really depressed or worried would be a better meal, perhaps. So I was living in a city and visiting the home in which I basically grew up. I was sleeping in an upstairs bathroom. It had a closet and one of those attic doors in the ceiling. I must say that my intuition is telling me that these two are separate experiences that happened over two consecutive nights. It's possible that there were a few nights in between, but I really don't think so. This is the most concise way I can describe these events. One of the two nights involved the shadow being, and I cannot recall at all at what point I saw it, so I'm just going to start with that. It was the summer, 
The window was open. I was lying on my back when the paralysis kicked in. As I mentioned before, at this point, I had already experienced this phenomena at least 10 times, but I got to say that this was different. More fear and visually strange things were happening, not hallucinations per se, but not, but for sure not normal. All I remember is going from attempting to get my mind around what was going on to seeing a big, long shadow in the corner. It totally looked like a hooded figure. The thing that is more important to note is that it felt like some sentient being of some sort. I was not alone at that moment in time, and I am, I am quite sure. And it 100% felt like this thing wanted to kill me, eat me, destroy me, terrorize me, etc. I don't remember the thing moving at all, though. It was such a strange memory. Again, no recollection of all of what happened when I snapped out of it. But I thought about that experience a lot afterwards. It was a new one in terms of my personal history of sleep paralysis. So, either the next night or a few nights later, again with the sleep paralysis. I was laying on my stomach this time, summer night, window open. Again, more intense than usual levels of fear, and I can't help but remember everything having like a purplish hue and being brighter than normal, although the lights were off. Man, that's a horrible description, but that detail needs to be included because it stands out of my memory. And now, out of left field and out of body experience. Yep, never had one before, but I have had plenty of experiences with high strangeness. I'll spare you anything but the facts from this point on. I am suddenly no longer in sleep paralysis mode in my bed, but what feels like a lucid dream. I am comfortable in the environment of lucid dreams, except I have no control whatsoever over what is happening. Next, I am looking into my own sleeping face, but only momentarily as I am being carried down the stairs of my home. That's the only way I can describe it properly. Maybe I was just floating around. I don't know, but it felt like something had picked me up and was carrying me down the stairs. There is a blurry part here. I know that I was also carried, floated, whatever, out the window and into the backyard. I clearly remember that. The only part I can't recall completely is if one of these out-of-body events also happened on the night of the shadow being or if it was like one night shadow being the next night out of body. In terms of shadow beings, before I listened to Where Did the Road Go, I thought I was the only one. To put it better, I sort of filed it away in my mind as generic sleep paralysis hallucination. But the thing that kept me thinking about it more than the others was how it felt. These events took place roughly between 2005 and 2006. I started looking heavily into the paranormal on the internet about two years ago. and This was uh, 2017 when he wrote this. Um... And that's that's the end of that one. Um, and he has one more that we're going to get to. But let's let's talk about this for a minute. I think Ren's probably going to have something to say. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, yeah, you're not alone. Um, these all of the things you've described, except for what sounds almost like an abduction experience. I, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I haven't had that being carried sensation, but I've definitely encountered, you know, shadow beings and things like that when in sort of out of body states and during sleep paralysis and sort of the, the weird lighting too. Like I know exactly what you're talking about. Like sometimes it usually manifests for me in that I see sort of uh, weird patterns of light on the ceiling or through the window. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, of course, I immediately thought it was like a you know UFO outside or something. Um, and and when I say abduction experience understand uh, if you if you're listening to the show that I, I don't mean that i think you were like abducted in the ufo kind of you know eth kind of sense I, I think those type of abduction experiences like the ones that whitley streber experienced and that a lot of people experience are in fact happening in that out-of-body state um right. that's something right. tim's talked about as well and and that definitely sounds like an abduction experience and and i think had he had a different uh, like if he had seen lights through his window before this happened, mm -hmm. maybe he would have couched it under the idea of UFO abduction. Yeah, exactly. Or if he'd seen like a gray or something like that. So it's it's yeah. almost interesting. It's like it's almost like he had that abduction experience, but he didn't have the the abduction meme in his head, right? So yeah. like it didn't take that form um, because he wasn't he wasn't thinking about grays and and UFOs and stuff. He was maybe thinking about you know i don't know demons or whatever but he mm -hmm. definitely felt that he was being carried away by something mm -hmm. right and, and floated like floated right. out of his window or whatever right right which is another common trope of the adoption experience yep yep yeah it de definitely like i said if he if he had you i could definitely see someone having a similar experiences but thinking that it was a ufo abduction yeah exactly because well, you, when you remember it you probably remember it differently even 
than what happened yeah. too. So it's Maybe not even he, like a screen memory thing. It's just like you just you you put whatever you already think onto that memory. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what I was going to say. Maybe he th- doesn't believe in all of that stuff, the alien abduction stuff anyway. Mm-hmm. So he well, doesn't, he said, well, he said he, he he's not, he's not going to see it. He said he wasn't really looking into the paranormal at the time. So yeah. Yeah. maybe that just never crossed his path. Right. So in the shadow thing, I mean, yeah, I've seen them in, I don't know if I've ever seen them in, in sleep paralysis. I've always seen them in normal consciousness. Sleep paralysis, I get weird stuff that, you know, like arms reaching through the, the bed and stuff <laughs> like that. I don't get shadows. Mm-hmm. It's, like that's nightmare not even, on, it's like Nightmare on Elm Street, man. But that's not, it's not even sleep paralysis because it's not like a lot of times it's not even the room I'm really in. Yeah. It's like I think I'm awake, but I'm not, you know. Yeah. I, think the, so I, think, I think the shadow person, seeing a shadow person is, is fairly common now for people that have this sleep paralysis and these experiences yeah that's how yeah. i understand it it's a yeah. pretty common thing there were examples in that documentary uh the nightmare yeah, that, of right. people yes. seeing shadow. and i mean you go back to the alpender story with you know the the original men in black they were these three yep. sort of shadow beings that appeared to him during an out-of-body experience seeing the hat band and all these kind of different creatures yeah mm-hmm uh, sometimes like he talks about that strong sense of like something trying to kill him like I've experienced that a lot too, though in my case, I usually don't see what it is. Like I'll get the sense that something's coming up the staircase or something's right outside my door and it's going to open the door any second. And when it opens the door, it's going to just, it's going to eat me or it's going to kill me. And I almost wonder if that isn't some sort of instinctual, like prey response, mm. right? Because like when you're asleep, you're like vulnerable to, yeah. to, pred- to predators, you know? So like maybe that's your, your automatic sense when you're, asleep and something like that happens is that sense that i'm being preyed upon something's trying to kill me like i have to fight back and that that causes yeah. that adrenaline rush it's something very very primal yeah it is mm-hmm. all right so he has one more and this one's very weird um like the other two weren't this one's <laughs> weirder and that is i don't know if it's as creepy but it's weird um so he says i'm in my early 20s i have no idea if it was spring or summer The time of day was just around dusk. I remember that it was just getting dark. I was living in a pretty big city at the time, big by Canadian standards, that is. So there was a long street that runs north to south on a big old slope. I'm walking south on the street, lots of people bustling around. I was really hungover, probably hadn't eaten properly in quite a while and feeling horrible. Where I was headed, I can't recall. Now, I can honestly say that I suddenly felt like someone, something was watching me, or if something tapped my attention, or if I just happened to look up and bam, but it felt like all three at once. I looked up from the street into these burning, hostile, angry eyes. These belonged to some dude. Said dude looked like he might have been a Mediterranean descent, black hair, kind of dark brown skin. I can't exactly remember what he was wearing. It was like a normalish jacket and jeans of some kind of thing though nothing that really stood out to me the strange part is this the guy was a good four big city blocks down the road from me but i totally remember knowing he was looking right at me and i was looking right at him and he was coming towards me there is only one part of the story so far that would separate it from any run-of-the-mill tale of being harassed by some random wacko i was already trying to decide if i was going to switch streets before he got too close or if i was going to stand my ground and continue walking toward him to put it more bluntly and technically irrational fear i was on a crowded street i did not recognize the guy it wasn't as if i saw him was thinking oh crap i banged his girlfriend i'm gonna get it but my gut was screaming at me that this individual was about to attack me in some way and at the same time the expression in his eyes was judging me sizing me up and challenging me i remember this train of thought next What the hell is this? I'm not going to switch streets just because some dude is looking at me crazy. Okay, I'm going to keep walking, but break eye contact. I remember my whole body filling with that fight or flight feeling, and it was as if I had to force myself to keep walking down the street. So I dropped my eyes to the concrete and kept stepping toward him. Like I said, he was about four blocks away, so there was more than enough time for me to change my mind and take another route. Uh, so the moment of truth, our paths are about to cross. There's no way in hell I'm going to look at this guy. I really hope he's just going to walk on by that. It was all in my head and that he isn't going to try and kill me right then and there on the street. (laughs) Then he spits right in front of my feet, directly in front of my feet. 
I don't remember what the spit looked like because I had to look up at that point. Why, why did I feel I have to look up? Simply out of attempting not to be a wuss is the best way to put it. So this guy has taken a few steps, and when I turn around, he isn't exactly right beside me, but he's only a few feet away. I don't think I said anything. His eyes were so angry. I really remember that, and he was totally waiting for a response from me. The thing I clearly remember him saying is, yeah, that's right, you keep going, in a really challenging tone, like daring me to even say anything. He said a few other things I don't remember. I did exactly that. I turned around and kept walking. This is where it gets strange. But again, I had already been living in the city for a long time. All kinds of crazy stuff had happened to me. Why was I so freaking convinced this guy was some kind of evil demon? But that is what I thought. I told people about it, knowing full well that it pretty much sounds like something that happens all the time in every city everywhere. But I clearly remember telling people what I felt and that this guy, uh, that I would see this guy again. And I did. So it's a few days later, same time of day. This experience is way different from the first one. This time I'm walking along, head down in a crowded part of the university campus that is in the city. I remember I had just finished crossing a crosswalk and was in front of a terrace with a lot of students on it, studying and drinking coffee. So I can't remember if I saw him or heard him first. I think I heard him first. It's, it's tough to explain. He hissed at me, and it made me jump, and I think I let out a yelp of some sort. It was like I was just walking along in my own thoughts and then hiss really fast and really close to me. And it was loud, too. And I really did jump into the air. I can't recall what he looked like when he was hissing, but I looked up right away. And after a second, when I knew what had just happened, he pointed at me and he goes, I got gotcha. you. Oh, I scared you. I got gotcha. you. And as he's walking away, I'm just <laughs> standing there. And then immediately... I went the other way. I didn't try to figure out who he was. I don't remember the reaction of any of the other people either. I just remember feeling like, what the heck was that? Again, after tons of internet research on all things strangeness for the past few years, I can only surmise that there's a possibility that my intuition was indeed correct. This guy wasn't totally human. Or he was just really crazy, a really crazy, scary guy I had the bad luck of running into twice. Or, for some reason, he followed me around after the first encounter because he really wanted to hiss at me and scare me and just waited for the perfect time. Um, and he says, hey, it is what it is. My only regret is I didn't take a sample of saliva from the street. That would have been the last thing in my mind at the t that time of my life, though. I was much more interested in boozing it up and playing music and trying to be cool. Kind of sounds like paranoia to me. Just a little bit. Like, He's like the, the the guy sees him, and the guy sees that he sees him, and he, the other guy's wondering why is this guy looking at me, hmm. and just decides to mess with him or gets angry that the that the person that wrote the story was looking at him. Could be that's kind of what it sounds like, and then maybe he saw him the next day or a few days later and just decided, well, I'm just going to mess with this guy. Cause apparently he's really <laughs> scared of me for some odd reason. <laughs> and, uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, uh, I don't know if you remember the David Bowie video from afraid of Americans. No. Uh, yeah. 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 Where he's like, he sees, <laughs> he sees Trent Reznor across the street and Trent Reznor's following him through the city, you know, and he's trying to mm -hmm. run away, mm -hmm. you know, like <laughs> that's kind of what it reminds me of. <laughs> Actually, it, it sort of reminds me of two things. Like, it, it has, like, shades of the Al Bender story. Because, mm. you know, after he has his encounter with the three men, he has a very similar sort of thing where he goes to the movie theater and this this guy in the movie theater who's apparently one of the men in black that appeared in his out-of-body experience, like, sits right next to him and is, like, staring at him. And then he tries to uh -huh. leave and he sees one of the men in the alley and... Like, he has this sort of mad dash back to his home. And he's, like, incredibly freaked out. Uh -huh. um, and the other thing is actually from uh, Ingo Swan's penetration, the, uh, the sort of what he apparently referred to as bio-androids, which were, uh, there's, like, an encounter he has with this, like, woman in a grocery store that he gets this super weird, like, threatening vibe from. And he gets ushered out by, you know, the mysterious... Mr. Axelrod, who tells him that that lady is actually an extraterrestrial and that they can smell psychics like they can tell people who are psychic because only psychics can like rat them out like only psychics can d 
determine that someone's an extraterrestrial. See, stuff mm. like that reminds me of gang stalking just a slight bit. Yeah. Does it not seem like that to you? It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that could have just been set up. Like you, like they have the target. He sees this old woman giving him the sink eye in the grocery store. Mm. And they're all in on it. Yeah. And he goes up to the other guy that goes up to him and says, oh, well, you know, she's an extraterrestrial. Yeah. I mean, you know, stuff like that just sure. sounds a lot like, like stuff that's in Camellio. If yeah. you've read that book. Yeah. No, you're totally right. And yeah. I mean, who, who knows? Because of all the weird sort of disinfo and, and MK ultra stuff that was going on at the time. Right. Like right. who knows if the whole Ingo Swan penetration saga wasn't just some kind of bizarro disinfo thing that they were putting him through. Yeah, it very well, very well could have been. And the same maybe for uh, Al Bender. Yeah, no, you Bender know, I mean, was. There's a possibility. Yeah, 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 possible. The Bender thing is 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 weird too because there's this sort of paranormal element to the whole thing. Well, yeah, it, it's really strange. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm not saying that there isn't a paranormal aspect to it. Yeah. But when he, someone like Bender, especially the people that were involved in all that UFO stuff mm-hmm. back in the 50s, mm-hmm. and they were all suspected of being basically communists or being watched. They were definitely being watched by the FBI. Yeah. For sure. So mm-hmm. they could have been being watched by somebody else. Yeah. And I think there could have been a lot of that kind of gang stalking, messing with people going on back then too that could be could be yeah like um i I think i thought of the the bio android thing because he mentioned that the guy who was who you know was was gave him the weird vibe across the street he looked maybe mediterranean and that immediately you think of like john keel yeah right and right. how they mm-hmm. those people would always seem sort of vaguely indeterminately Mediterranean looking. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't discount his his sense of things at the time though, that uh, that menacing sort of sense and the fact that he spotted this guy four bl- huge blocks away. Yeah. So so what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to say is that, that was obviously an extraterrestrial from the moon. <laughs> and you're psychic now because of your out of body experiences, and he could tell that you were psychic and you're a threat to him. So you have to be really scared of everyone you meet now because everyone could be an extraterrestrial. Okay. Wow, I didn't definitely take not, from it at all. Definitely just not a, trying to put you in a mental hospital. Just ask uh just ask David Jacobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a reptilian. He has a red, right. that's why he kissed. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a he's a hubrid. Let's get it right now. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, okay. let's not go crazy here with reptilians. <laughs> Come on, Ren. So I, I, let's, let's be reasonable. <laughs> I, I, I think if I had that experience, it would probably freak me out a little bit. No. Oh, definitely. yeah. It yeah. would definitely freak you out for just if it's a normal person. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like... I mean, I, I, somebody honks at me because I wait too long at an intersection. And I'm still thinking about it three days later, you know. <laughs> Much less yeah. somebody like spitting on the ground and like saying weird stuff to me. Yeah, that yeah. Would freak me out. Well, well, that's the thing with all these people that are talking about like, you know, I'm a, I'm scared of aliens, or I'm scared of ghosts, or I'm scared of demons. Like, a flesh and blood human can just be as evil and scary as any oh. of those. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, really. Yeah, because if you're especially if you're dealing with somebody on the street that's yeah. like, possibly mentally ill and. Or maybe just having a really which, bad day and trying to sort of fight with you, you know? Which yep. there's a lot of mentally ill people on the street. Yep. Mm-hmm. I would much rather run into an alien than just have some random human being like try to start a fight with me in public. Like, yeah. I'm yeah. way more scared of being stabbed than dealing with a gray alien. Says the yeah. person but, that you to get punched in the face for fun. Well, that that was for fun. It was all consensual. <laughs> <laughs> me me getting shanked is not consensual. All right. Well, well, well Rin, you could actually, um, you could actually any of those any of the other supernatural creatures, you can just banish. So exactly, yeah. You're not I, you're I not as, you're not as scared of them. Yeah. So. <laughs> See, I don't own the human banishing, uh, you know, magical apparatus, which is called a firearm. It's not a thing that I have. <laughs> <laughs> you could still open a portal, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to end there for this listener stories edition. And uh, 
If you have a story you'd like to share, email us at stories at where did the road go dot com. That is the best place to send them. Um, and where can people find you, Adam? They can find me at www.conspiranormal.com or the archives at conspiranormal.podomatic.com. And Ren? You can find me at uh, liminalroom.com. All right. Thank you both. Thanks, everyone. And a special shout out to our patrons pledging $10 or more Allison Cook, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Nick Martin, Super Inframan, UFO Weekly News, Tim, Maria, Nate Syria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, American Rambler, Paul Buscini, Kevin, Chris Johnson, 36 Dingo, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Ben Crow, Janet Runyon, Andy McNamara, Sasha Lorg, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Rogelio Gonzalez, Anthony Sullivan, Roland Belstadt, Robert Groom, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Craig Sisternos, Charles Beauregard, Matthias Sunby, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.